I do this. So I'm a quality evangelist and solution architect with Aptitools based out of Pune in India. You can find my Twitter ID and LinkedIn on screen. Uh, please do connect with me. I would love to continue conversations uh, later on as well. And a uh, little background about me, I think, is important because that shares the context of what we are going to speak about as well. So I've been part of the testing space now for more than 20 years. I started as a tester, not by choice. Probably few of you relate to that, how you got into the testing industry. I wanted to become a developer. But a few months after I got started in testing, I quickly realized I don't want to turn back because the kind of opportunities, the kind of challenges that I'll get is very different. But the real transformation came when I was working as a customer support engineer as part of Borderland Software. And that is when I realized the value of quality. Earlier, it was about testing, but as customer success or customer support, you realize how quality is important. And that completely changed my mind. And that's how I graduated from started with testing and moved into quality. Since then, I've played various different roles related to quality, how I can help influence, build a better quality product. Worked with product and services organizations across the world. I'm open source contributor, Selenium, APM, and uh, many others. And that's what I do. And I shared my experiences in forums like this. So again, thank you for the opportunity. Now, this background is important because I've seen the industry change a lot in these 20 years, how it has evolved. And a lot of us might be thinking, is AI really a hype? Is it just a buzzword or what the impact really is going to be? So let's understand from you, what do you think AI is doing for the industry? Is it a hype? Is it a buzzword? Everyone seems to be doing AI now. What's going on? What do you think? It is going to Okay, that's one. Jobs might not be there uh, the same way, at least that we have been used to. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's going to create jobs. I think that's a very positive outlook of it, right? Because yeah, some things will go, but it will create something else out of it. That's some uh, evolution of sorts, right? Sorry, you were yeah. saying. Yeah, so it's part of it. Yeah. It will take more jobs away than it will create. Uh, and time will tell, right? These are all things that what we think we understand what's going to happen, but who can really predict the future, right? No, we never know. Uh, things will change. But what it is, what is sure is if we are creative, if we are innovative, if we embrace change, then positive things are more likely to happen than negative. At least we tried, right? At least that's the way I look at it. Yeah. How to keep your husband happy? And any good options? I copy and send it to my wife. It's going to be a great tool for all of us. I'm interested in the follow up story. Did yeah. Bard respond to I the suggestions that you came out? I think this is a better topic than the yeah. one we are talking about. <laughs> but that's where humans come into picture, right? We don't read disclaimers. We don't read the fine print. It doesn't apply to us.
करेक्ट absolutely absolutely uh just one more thing on that philosophical note before we jump into the core uh, topic right is when automation started kicking up it was thought of that manual testing is dead we are going to have no jobs remaining for manual testing the reality is automation has messed things up bad and we need manual testing more than before for that matter because unfortunately the way we automate probably we are not able to trust the results of that right we still need a lot of manual testing so yeah cool yeah uh, no that's a reality that's a reality it's difficult for us to trust <laughs> but the reality coming back again to the core topic right this is a gartner report uh, and i'll zoom in a little bit this is for ai this is an old report uh, and a very old report considering this is the age of AI, 2021. So it's a long time ago. Uh, but what it says is in the current stage, the way we see uh, AI evolve, there are certain aspects which are going to be available to the users, to the end users, to the uh, general public of sorts. And we are seeing that operation. Chatbots, I think they've become amazing. Uh, very frustrating as well, because sometimes your issue is just not there in the chatbot uh, scheme of things, but that is getting better and better. We are seeing autonomous vehicles. That is a reality. Uh, so it's not just an illusion that's going to happen. We are in a state where we are starting to see this being operational. Not everywhere, but it's coming. Eventually it will happen. Likewise, computer vision, semantic search, is getting better and better. It's becoming more of a reality where we are. So this is not just a buzzword anymore. A lot of organizations, products are jumping on the AI bandwagon. That might be buzzwords or a marketing strategy, or they might really be using AI. We don't know. Uh, and not right for me to comment on that. But we know this is a reality and it is going to come through at some point or not. And we need to see how we can adopt and get better at that. So with that, uh, chat GPT has become the most popular of all, but there are many other generative AI technologies out there. BARD has become phenomenally well, uh, at least based on what I've read. I've not used it, but uh, that is becoming really good. There are many other such technologies that are becoming available for you to experiment and try it out. And in fact, a lot of products have started building on top of those already as new offerings. So jobs are not going away. You are going to get creative. You are going to create new product offerings as an example, where you'll have opportunity to work and contribute in different ways. Okay. We'll focus today on how can we leverage some of these AI technologies from a testing and automation perspective. Do we represent testing quality roles over here or are, they, are there any other roles that we are working on as well? Developers, managers or anything or are we all focused on testing and automation yeah. you look at quality overall across uh, things right okay so when it comes to testing right uh, i have some examples over here but we'll try to do this live uh, how many of you have tried chat gpt for it that matter almost everyone cool so then i'm not going to show the screenshots and all that i have we'll take something live and uh, try to make it interesting uh, okay. The screenshots are based on an e-commerce website, Amazon USA, and how you would approach leveraging something like chat GPT to test uh, this type of product. Okay. Uh, so a typical testing approach, you've got four stages. If you think about it from a testing life cycle point of view, right? There's a strategy that is design. Uh, there's automation and execution and result analysis as well. Okay. In what context have you tried to use chat GPT? Automation. Automation. What do you mean by automation? So when 
experience. So if I am not able to do this problem, so in this case I'm not able to do this element something. I will put my credit in and it will also be used. So the implementation side of it, but not the estimation really. No, for the estimation, I just give me some formulas how I can calculate. Okay. Hmm. How much is it? So it will be some formula, not the actual estimation, but some some formula it will be. Okay. okay. Great. So that's a very interesting use case. Yeah. Regex. Correct. Yeah, I think a simple example is when the smartphone came about, right? How many of us remember phone numbers anymore? Maybe just a couple of them for really close people that we are who we call frequently. But how many of us remember phone numbers anymore? We don't need to. When I was studying, maths was very important because for any basic calculations, we didn't have calculators. Our school did not allow calculators because we had to train ourselves to get better at computation so that it becomes easy in the real world. But how many of us try to do multiplication or additions manually? Whatever happens, we quickly take out a phone, calculate it, and use it. Right? Correct. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but <laughs> that's a separate conversation. Okay. That's a separate conversation. But what you said is very important. If you lose that technology, access to the technology is going to be a problem. Okay. But at the same time, if you have access to the technology, do you have to keep reinventing the wheel? Or can I use my, uh, what is really, uh, an ingrained thing for me, right? The brain power, the thinking power to use it to solve different problems in a much more better way. So you can avoid reinventing the wheel. What he mentioned as an example, right? For automation, you don't, or you mentioned regex as well, for example, right? You don't have all SQL queries. You don't have to remember the minute details because now you have the tool giving you access to that information readily. So can you move beyond that problem and focus on bigger areas. How many of us use VI editors or uh, sublime type editors for typing code? We don't need to because we've got uh, good IDs, IntelliJ, Eclipse, Visual Studio Code. There's online IDs as well that gives us intelligence that guides us to write better code. Why do I need to remember the syntax and everything on my own? As long as the concepts are clear, I'm clear in my idea, I'll be able to implement that. And that's what we need to think about, right? How is this technology going to help us? Things that we used to do from scratch. We don't need to do that anymore. We can leverage the tool to get started. Now, can we trust that? Kapil was mentioning earlier about citation, right? Uh, uh, Kapil or someone was, what were you mentioning? No, we was, uh, yeah, uh, he was mentioning about citation. You just ask to give a citation about something and it makes it up. The tool is going to make up some citation which you feel is real. Now, is that valid or not? That's where the human intelligence again comes in to see is this really usable or not. Likewise, the code that is generated. How is the code learned? It is based on all the code that is available in the public internet. Now, I have written really crappy code in the past. It has learned from that as well, I'm guessing. So you have to be careful about the solutions that are given. And you have to apply your mind on top of it to say, is this usable for me or not? Okay. So let's take some more uh, deeper examples. Yeah. It's a lawyer in the US who submitted a case file for the Supreme Court for this case. Um, that big business case. Mm -hmm. That business case covered by the lawyer. Yeah. It's going to be very difficult to figure it out. Very difficult. Deep fakes, we were again speaking about that earlier, right? Uh, news media and all that. You don't know what to trust or not anymore. That's why I prefer in person, right? I don't know. I might see a count of 20, 30, 100,000 as there in the webinar or in the meeting, but I don't know if they're bots or they're real people, right? 
<laughs> so it's difficult. But now I trust this. Yeah, I have this amazing group of people who are sitting in front of me. I know they are real. They are not deep fakes <laughs> over there, right? So let's uh, let's focus on what are the different ways you can use Chat GPT, for example, to make your life easier. And again, we'll focus in the context of testing and uh, the overall uh, automation uh, life cycle. But hopefully these examples will help you think about different areas where you could apply it as well. Okay. So from a strategy perspective, how many of us typically start on a new project or a new feature that needs to be developed, which is a complex feature, a completely different type of feature. And you need to start from scratch. It's not just a new set of user stories that I'm going to work on. Does anyone do that? Yeah, we do that, right? Every now and then there'll be certain different product or project that we work on which requires a completely different way of thinking, or you have to start from the scratch, think about the overall strategy plan, and then get started with the execution. Could you leverage chat GPT for that? Typically each organization might have some type of templates and all that can be used, but templates is there valuable only up to a certain level. It will give you all the headers and the sections that need to be there. You still need to fill that out on your own. But what if you need to do something more than that, right? So, Using us uh, that as a reference, if for example you say I want to, I am building a new e-commerce platform, which is in a way similar to Amazon. Now this is an internal product; it's not yet out there. It's an internal product, but sort of the theme is related to the e-commerce platform Amazon. What would be the test strategy for that type of product? Now, if you ask this question, create a test strategy for testing and automating Amazon USA you would be surprised at what type of answer it, uh, you get it. You'll get a lot of information around what typically a strategy has, right? High level content. Now in this particular case, it was not very useful because it was so generic. It is almost like a Wikipedia entering what is a test strategy, okay? So what that meant is I need to ask questions. There's a saying, right? You ask a stupid question, you get a stupid answer. You ask a silly question, you get a silly answer. Something like that over here, right? You have to get better at articulating your questions in order to get meaningful responses. So if I asked a better question and the better question, and this is what I really liked about chat GPT. Again, as I said, I have not used Bard or any other tool uh, similar uh, to this right now, but you can keep iterating uh, and getting better uh, refining your questions. So I'm just saying give a concrete strategy for the above use case. I don't have to repeat everything. And in this case, it gave me much more better type of response, not just the different sections that need to be there in your strategy document, but concrete ideas for testing the e-commerce platform. And because I use a reference of a public website, which is going to be similar to what I'm building, it is pretty relevant. Now, does it mean that all these uh, details are given, my work is done, instead of taking three days estimate to create a strategy, I'm done in five minutes, I'm going to take the rest of the time off, go to the beach or wherever, right? No, because this is not very usable. Why is this not usable? Exactly, it's not contextual to what I'm building. It's a better reference than what I had as a standard template, but it's not exactly what I need. But now I've got a good, better blueprint available based on the scope of my uh, application, what exactly is being implemented or not. I'm going to make this better. And that becomes a very, very valuable thing because this way you're not going to forget anything. You're getting good references and you can very easily remove things that are unwanted because it's not relevant to you. Right? So is that something that you've already tried before? using it to create some sort of a strategy or a plan. Yeah. Did you think it was valuable? Did it work? How much close, how close was it to what we actually wanted? Sixty, 70%. Okay. Correct. So did it actually save time for you or? Uh... Yeah. Okay. 
Okay. Right. So that's a great way to get started, right? And typically you want to spend as less time on planning and documentation. And that's my approach, right? Do enough so that you can get started and iterate over it. That's how you learn from what is happening and uh, you proceed uh, adding value. Uh, the real agile way, right? You iterate quickly, you get feedback and you uh, proceed accordingly. So this becomes a great way to start uh, in that direction. But what is a strategy without risks? And that is a part that we typically forget about. We think it's obvious things, right? We know this can go wrong or something. But do we really think about risk mitigation? Especially in context of, we were speaking earlier about uh, financial or uh, fund management, for example, right? What are the risks of something not working well? There's a big financial impact, which can have legal consequences as well because of the domain that it represents. So you need to think about risk. How often do we really think about it? So again, based on the context that you have refined, you could ask it, okay, what are the risks that might come up for this type of approach? And how do I mitigate it as well? So you're not just asking about the top risks, uh, but again, that can give you very insightful data. You get this information quickly in a few minutes, you iterate over it, refine what makes sense, what doesn't, that can give you 10 other ideas or questions that you will go talk to your product team and others to figure out how we are going to handle these things. That is a typical markdown thing, actually, if you look at it, right? Uh, markdown, if you enter and uh, you try sub points, depending on the markdown editor, that happens. Yeah. So the markdown editor that it has probably uh, does it in that fashion. It's a limitation, not a, or it's a feature. Sir? Yeah. Yeah. Also, for that matter, I have to be truthful. These screenshots are a couple of months old, which is again very old in the AI era. <laughs> it changes almost every day. You don't know how it's going to evolve. But it's a markdown editor. Again, if you look to take this and directly present it, of course, it's not going to be a good presentation. It's not going to be a good document that you're presenting which thankfully I think the tool should introduce such type of issues, right? So that you don't, you don't just blindly take it and uh, send it forward. You actually spend time understanding it, refining it, correcting it, and then uh, proceed. So I think it's a good feature. Of course, you are, it's constantly learning. So you're making our life easier. So you think that now you take learnings from your Correct. Okay. So risk uh, identifying of risks and mitigating that is an aspect typically again that we do not think much about. Even if it is not your responsibility, maybe it's your lead or manager or someone else creating that and you're just part of the team executing towards that. It's a great thing for you to learn quickly without spending a lot of time. What else could I do? And that's a great way of learning and evolving yourself improving your skill sets as well. So that is something that I would definitely encourage you to do. Uh, think about even if it's not my responsibility, okay, how would I create a strategy doc? This is what my team has created or my manager has created. This is what the tool is telling me. Is there any gap over there? How can I learn from the best of both and get better? So use it as a learning tool without spending a lot of time. I think that can also be a great resource for you. And that's a part of evolving, evolving again, right? The next thing is from a design perspective. You have a feature set, you know the requirements, you need to start thinking about how do I test it? What do I test? How do I test? Again, ChatGPT can give you great insights for that aspect as well. This is not Hong Kong. <laughs> Long story, uh, this is uh, not uh, AI related. Okay. So, what are the test scenarios? Now you have your requirements, which you have already given to chat GPT. Uh, you have the risks as well. Based on that context, what could be the different set of top 10 scenarios that you have, right? So what are the most critical test scenarios? Typically, this would again be there in your strategy or your business document. What are the most common or popular use cases that we are designing this for? And based on that context, again, there's a lot of good information that can come across. And these are all very relevant. I ask a very vague question about testing Amazon USA, a concrete strategy. It's still very vague, right? Very general. We're not talking about which product, what 
feature over there. Amazon has got thousands of features and uh, capabilities over there. But we are not talking about web or mobile or anything. Very general. But the scenarios are still very relevant from an end user perspective. Now, if I'm thinking about it as an admin, I need to refine my questions. Top 10 scenarios for or critical scenarios as an admin. But if I do not give that, it is telling Amazon, it's a B2C type of product. What are the top 10 critical scenarios over there? And it, uh, these are all, if you go through it, I think they're very, very relevant. Just as an end product can be very valuable. So I think this is again, a very good set of regression scenarios that you can come up with. Again, is this the complete list? Of course not. Is this the right uh, prioritized list? Maybe not because you know what your application changes are happening. But based on this, you can identify, have you missed thinking of anything? It's a good starting point over there. Now, scenarios are end-to-end -end journeys. Each scenario can have hundreds of test cases, minute granular test cases. What are the test cases that you can have for one of those scenarios? So list 10 cases for product search and filtering scenario. And I got this product search and filtering from the test cases that it had given me earlier. So I'm not making things up over here, leveraging information that it's giving and going to the next level. And again, it gives very interesting type of scenarios. So now for your product, which might have similar or different feature sets, though it's an e-commerce platform, you can learn a lot from other type of products as well and see where the gaps are in your functionality, what is applicable, not applicable, and you can still make it very relevant. In many cases, this list is going to be applicable to your e-commerce platform as well. You just have to tune it, tweak it a little bit based on what your application is doing. So I thought this was really amazing. Uh, literally in 10 minutes, I can have the full strategy, scenarios, test cases, everything available to me, which I can start tweaking and making it better. Okay. Have you tried identifying scenarios and test cases using chat GPT? You should try it out. You should try it out. And it doesn't matter if you're doing automation or not. Right? This is about what is your requirement? What are, how are you going to approach testing itself? And you might be surprised of the things that you have missed just because it's obvious in your mind when you're testing, you will certainly check those things, but it's not really identified as a explicit test case. And that might become very important for you as well. Now, these things to me are okay. Uh, I am more of a hands-on person. I like to be less in documentation and more in actual implementation, actual testing work. So this is good. I quickly want to get this out of the way and focus on the core aspect. How do I test it? The next big challenge that comes in testing is test data. Is test data a challenge? I have to yet to find someone who says test data is not a challenge. So it's always a challenge, right? Even if it's a hello world type of example, you can have so many different test cases for that as well, right? So how do you generate test data for this type of product? Now, again, we are talking about a very massive product, Amazon website or app over here. What test data do we need for that? So you can ask what type of data do I need? Because typically we'll just say, I want to search for a product I'm going to use. Okay, I like iPhone or the latest iPhone. I every time just keep searching for that. But what about something else? So you can ask what type of uh, data do I need for testing this type of product? Very generic again, but it gives you the variety, the spread of information that might be required for this. Whether it is search criteria, filter criteria, and the criteria might again change based on the type of product. So if you say I want to search for an electronic product, the filter criteria would be different. In electronic itself, computers versus phones versus TVs, it's different filter criteria. So all that data, the variety of data is going to be very different. So you should definitely leverage this to say in any type of product that you're working on, what type of data is going to be required to test this type of functionality. That can help a lot. Again, based on your context, what type of market set of products you cater to, it will have to be tweaked and tuned according to that. But it again is a very good start to ensure you don't miss out on anything. Okay. Getting to automation, test data is also good. And that data is required for manual testing and for automation, right? It's again, you know, generic across what type of activity you might be doing. But if you start focusing on the automation, 
how do you get started on that? Maybe there is a team who might not be comfortable with automation, who might not be doing automation, not have learned automation, or not have done it for a quite some time. So you might be rusty. You might not feel confident. You want to get started with it. So you could say, okay, if I have to automate this, how do I automate? I ask a silly question, I get a silly answer. I get a verbose documentation. I know this approach, this is straightforward, but how do I actually implement? So if I ask it, okay, implement this first test using a particular tool set, and I get the complete code over there. And remember this code has been learned from all the good and bad coding that's out there, right? So take it, but I have actually copied this code, put it in my ID, run it, it works. The only reason this, uh, yeah, yeah, this is good code. I would, uh, uh, this was, it learned from my code, this one. <laughs> Not this one, actually, the next one is better. <laughs> that was mine. Sorry? We'll get to that. Yeah, we'll get, uh, I'll talk about the good and bad of that as well. Yeah. Okay. But the interesting thing is this is working code. Now, the reason this code did not work for me is because I was sitting in India and I'm automating Amazon US. Okay. Now, if I go to amazon.com for US region, it's going to give pop-ups. Oh, you are coming from this region. Are you sure you want to go here or there, right? Uh, those different types of pop-ups and all will come. And my test failed because of that. But if I was, if I had said, okay, implement this test for Amazon India website, I'm pretty sure it would have worked out of the box. But the code worked. And this was a basic simple test that was there, right? Simple hello world type of test. And the interesting thing was it used JUnit, but it gave me all the right annotations before and after, which managed the driver and everything. And this is where it gets interesting. This is where you cannot take it blindly. You see this one line of code over here. Uh, it's actually difficult to read, but this is the old way of using Selenium where you provide the path to your Chrome uh, browser driver. Okay. It's an old style. Even before Selenium 4, there is a better way of managing your browser drivers that is using a uh, web driver manager, at least in the Java world. Uh, for other programming languages, it is slightly different. So this code is not optimal, but it works. The reason this is not optimal, it has learned based on code, uh, based on uh, resources before I think 2021, sometime in 2021. So the learning that it has done is little dated. It doesn't have the latest references. So you could tell it, okay, I don't want that code. Give me the above code using web driver manager. So then it updated the code. Everything is the same, but it is now using web driver manager to say, how do I get the browser drive? So that means you yourself now need to know how to ask your questions better. You need to be aware of different things that are there because if you are asking old style questions, you will get answers based on that style. So you still have to keep updated on new tools, technologies, concepts, maybe design patterns or whatever else that might be required in that context and ask the right type of question to get the answer. If you don't use this, you are still stuck in the read it and uh, stack overflow days where you ask a question, you get thousands of resources. A lot of them will point to blogs which are incorrect or resources that are incorrect and you'll end up implementation that way. So this gives you a better way. And again, it allows you to iterate over the questions as well, right? It's giving you a solution instead of you finding the right solution out of it. Now, how many of us write code like this? I don't because it's not one test that is implemented. You typically implement hundreds of tests because the application is complex. So what do we do in that case? We've got some design pattern implementations. So most common design pattern in automation world? Page factory, page object model. Page factory, by the way, you should never use. Simon Stewart, the creator of WebDriver is saying that was shown as an example, but so many people started using it. Now he cannot remove it because things will break for everyone. It's a very inefficient way of implementation. Don't use page factory. But page object model, it's a, a design pattern that can be leveraged to code uh, in a better fashion. So you could ask chat GPT, implement the test using page object pattern. And it gave that type of implementation as well. Now, will this code work for you? Most likely not. Why? Because application has got performance issues, right? You're working on test application or test environment or something. 
loading issues might be there, network issues might be there. You have to manage the weights accordingly based on what your application performance is expected. So you cannot just blindly take this code and run it and expect it to work in CI or any machine wherever you're running. You might have issues. I'm saying might. That's where you need to start looking at the code that is generated and seeing how can I optimize it and make it more effective. Okay. So that uh, becomes very important. Also, there might be certain aspects over here which are old style implementations. So you need to be careful about that aspect as well. But again, this code also works. If there are no weight issues, this code will also work because it's a simple enough code on a public website. On an internal website, this code might not work because it's a new feature you are adding on to the Amazon website, which is going to break this code because ChatGPT does not know about that. It's an internal website, internal feature. It's not yet available in production. But you can still take this information, tweak it, tune it, change it as required, and make your test implementation faster, which is, I think, some of the example you shared above earlier, right? That's what you also did. You took it. You took it in context, you updated it as required and made it work for you. I'm a Java person, uh, though I can dabble with other programming languages a little bit. I'm mostly Java person. So by default, at least this was uh, back in time, a uh, couple of weeks, months back in time, the default programming language that ChatGPT always used for giving uh, solutions was Python. Maybe that's the primary language uh, it uses or it uh, supports, not sure, but which is fine. You would just say, okay, give me the code in Java or JavaScript or anything, right? And you'll get similar uh, solutions. Any thoughts so far about this? You wanna see any code being implemented? Yeah. Compared to? Correct. So now uh, let's try it out. Let's try it out. I need to stop this. You can always take a look at the other one. Yeah. Okay, so let's take this. Let's take some website. Uh, tell me a website. Sorry? Red bus. Okay, give me the test strategy for red bus if I can type correctly. Now, red bus test plan, impressive business models, how to write test strategy, solve marketing strategy. What out of this is interesting to you? That is going to answer your question. Yeah. You have to go through those articles and figure out what is it. Instead, I'll take the same question. I'm putting it in chat GPT. It's giving me a very generic uh, strategy right now. Maybe it doesn't know about Redbus. Uh, Redbus.in, right? That's what you're talking about. Redbus has been around for some time, but this is not a good question that I have asked. Give me the test strategy for doing what? For testing and automating Redbus. Let's see if it's going to give me something better. It's still giving me the same thing. Okay, let's stop this. For redbus.in. It's still giving me the generic one. So I have to ask the question in a better way. Let's take some other website, which is pro something more popular, for example. JB Hi-Fi, does it have a website? Yeah. For yeah. automating I made it think. <laughs> it's, I think, giving the similar type of uh, 
okay so stop give me a concrete strategy for the about i'm very bad in asking questions as you can see from me right still the same thing strategy is a very general one so it is but for amazon it gave a pretty good one right yeah it's it's learning out of it right and this is where it is there are actually so many courses and i came across on twitter yes i'm still on twitter not on threads but uh, about people have written books probably generated using chat gpt or whatever about prompt engineering i don't know what it really means but clearly i need that because i'm not asking the right question what important skill we need to learn is asking the right question over here that is going to be very important <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes and no. Uh, yes, because yes, uh, you need to, of course, ask the right question to get meaningful answers. Like I clearly asked the you know, very silly or generic question uh, to get that type of answer. But now based on chat GPT, there are many other tools that sit on top of it that make it very effective. For you. Okay. So that is very powerful. So you cannot get restricted to just chat GPT. Bard has come up with many interesting features now. I did a webinar back in Feb on the first webinar based on chat GPT. And I did a follow-up in March or April. Things had changed tremendously in that time. That is a long time ago in the AI world. On top of that, there have been so many other products. Uh, Auto GPT is another one that can actually build products for you. You give it a set of requirements and it is going to generate a product out of that for you on your machine. So there's a lot of interesting tools out there. I don't think you can ask chat GPT what other AI tools are there because it might not have learned about everything else that is going on. But that's where still Google search and all uh, will be helpful to understand more about that, about photo editing or learning tools and all. There will be better tools to address that type of uh, requirement. But there is one very interesting thing uh, that is there. So let's say test. And I have this as an example. Uh, later as well, but let's take some test pyramid. Let me use what I have created because I've got a different representation for it. Okay. So this is one of the uh, diagrams that I use to explain the test pyramid. I've just copied the URL. But looking at this, you might not understand what this pyramid is really about. What does this web service and different arrows and all mean, right? So I could uh, ask ChatGPT, explain this. Did I not copy that? Copy image link. Okay. And now it has copied a lot of things, but I don't care. Let's see. The interesting thing was that it is able to read images or read resources and summarize. That was fascinating to me. Correct. Very interesting use case. I haven't thought about it. No, definitely not tried it. 
but that seems to be a very interesting use case. I would just be very careful when using tools in the public domain for internal search, right? And sharing that. Um, Yeah, but private GPT is different from what he's asking, right? That will take care of the privacy aspect. What he's saying is log into a database and understand the database schema, database model. Sorry, auto GPT will be able to do that. So auto GPT can actually generate your applications, but will it be able to explain as well? I don't know about that. It is able to generate that. Okay. Okay. Interesting. So the paid version also gives you an option to keep it private. In fact, if you go to these settings over here, there are APIs. Yes. The plus version gives you API access as well. And uh, also the privacy aspect is also taken care of in that you have a choice of saying, do not share whatever I am using it for. Do not share it to auto learn. But I don't know how much I would trust that right now, frankly speaking. Just a tester mindset in me, right? That what if that flag is unintentionally uh, not working? That setting is not honored. I'm a skeptic in that sense uh, when it comes to the testing side of it. Yeah. There is another game changer in the automation space. I'll uh, talk about that as well. And because you have to be my time cop, okay? Because we can keep talking about this for a yeah. No, we are, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. Uh, so uh, let's move. Yeah, please. We are. Yeah, I'm going to put it out on YouTube. I'll share it on the meetup group as well. So it will be there. It will be there. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, we are talking about the challenges, right? Expats, uh, for example, locators changing and all. And that is something where uh, you don't really need chat GPT, but there are better ways to address it over here. And I will talk about the Apple tools way, how they uh, do this aspect, but there will be other ways as well uh, for it. Okay. So, Inefficient automation, that's just programming. It's not just about uh, automation. Uh, the scaling of execution is also another challenge because how do we scale the same test to execute across different browsers, for example, right? That is a problem. And it's also going to be slow and flaky tests. Slow because I have to manually inspect each and every element or state of the application. So there's a lot of time involved in retrieving that information and working on it. And flaky because locators can change or performance issue of the application might cause it to not load correctly. Hence, automation can fail as well, right? So, and data is also an important aspect over there, uh, but we'll not talk about that right now. Now, what Apple Tools does, right? It uses visual AI. Remember the hype cycle? Computer vision was one part of it. Now, that report was not influenced by Apple Tool or created by Apple Tool. It's Gartner report. And it is spot on because based on what Apple Tools has been able to achieve in computer vision is spot on with what that uh, report also says. So what Apple Tools does is it uses computer vision using AI technology. It compares the images and it tells you how it compares with the expected baseline. So baseline is something that you need to provide or it will capture the first time the test runs. But every subsequent time when you run the same test, let's say I'm just loading the homepage. I just want to compare the homepage. 
I don't need to have n number of locators to figure out how to get this state, that state. Am I logged in? Is the cart empty or not by default? And so on, right? Are the images loaded correctly or not? Is anything broken or not? Uh, I don't have to write code for that. AppTools using AI will automatically be able to compare the two screens, baseline and the new screen, without any need of locator. The only way, uh, place where you need the locator is if you want to click on something to go to the next page or enter your credentials, for example, any interaction, you still use that existing automation to do that interaction. Once the interaction is done, all the validation is done using AI by applications. So that with the dependency on locators goes away completely. And what that means is you don't have to worry about dynamic data. You can using the right combination of algorithms, focus on things that are actually different that actually matter in your context of the application. So you have the choice, you have the control of saying which algorithm to use, what combination of algorithms to use to do the right type of validation. So this is where you don't even need to generate expats or locators. You don't have to worry about it. The developers might change the locators and all doesn't matter. As long as the locators that you need to interact are the same, which your automation tool needs, the validation does not need the locators, okay? So typical automation, you will have navigations and a lot of validation code. This is a Cypress example. It could be any automation tool. All of that can be replaced with one call to Appy tools to do the validation for you. That's a huge positive loss of dependency on your application state to do the validations. Also, this gives you control and it works with dynamic data as well. So, you know, applications are going to have dynamic data, right? Context is going to keep changing or data is going to keep changing. It works with that as well. It can work with any of the automation tools that you have. Open source or commercial does not matter. You'll be able to uh, go through all of them or use Appy tools with all of them as well. Okay. Now, it is with UI. Exactly. This example is focused for applications with the UI, right? But this is where the computer vision comes in, the vision aspect comes in, right? Uh, the other aspect is of scaling. The product works on Chrome. What about Safari, Firefox, Edge, mobile web, tablets? What about that? Typical strategies, I want to run the same test on all the browser again, just to make sure everything is fine. With the AI approach, uh, Happy Tools takes for the ultra fast grid, you run the test just once, but the rendering will happen on all the different browsers and validations will happen automatically. So if 100 tests take one hour to execute, you've got seven browser combinations. Essentially you're running 700 tests. Essentially it's about seven hours plus for execution time. With the ultra fast grid, you can run only 100 tests, but in one hour, five minutes, one hour, 10 minutes, you get results from all 700 tests execution. Huge scaling advantage that you get. You get functional and visual validation in that same approach. So the scaling again is where AI can help tremendously with visual that becomes a huge value add. So this is how it would be. You run the tests on local. Anytime you want a validation, it will go to the ultra fast cloud, render the same screen on those browsers. Then the validation happens. Results come back to your same test that is executed. So you run it on local or in CI. In that test run itself, you get the validation results of all your different browsers and devices. Amazing way to scale and get past feedback. Okay. Now, when it comes to flaky tests, flaky tests could be for n number of reasons. So it's very important if anyone does rerun, auto rerun of tests, if tests are failed, you can raise your hands. That's fine. I see nods. Please don't do that though. <laughs> Don't rerun tests automatically because the tests have failed for a particular reason. Yes, I know you are under time pressure, but if you do not analyze and understand why the test has failed and try to fix the problem at the source, it is going to keep coming back to you at some point or the other. So it's very important to understand the root cause of failures and fix it over. There. But now, how do you identify failing tests? This is where I really like report portal. It is AI ML based tool. It's an open source tool, which has a commercial side as well in terms of support and uh, other aspects, but you could very well go to reportportal.io, download the Docker image, set it up immediately. In five minutes, you have a reporting server ready in your environment. You run the test with data coming into report portal and 
any test fails, you have to take a decision on those. This is failed because of environment issue, data issue, whatever issue, right? Then it starts learning. You have to, of course, enable the auto analysis feature out of it. It starts learning and it will automatically categorize failures for you and saying, when the test ran again, oh, this is because of a data issue. This is because of an environment issue. You don't have to go and manually keep tagging the test and figuring out what is going. Another beautiful thing that it has, one of the widgets is about identifying the flaky tests. You keep running the test over a period of time. It will tell you in a widget, which tests are more flaky than the others. So you know where the problem lies. Is it in your application, your test implementation, your environment? At least you know which test to focus on first to try and get better value. Amazing tool. I don't work for report portal. I have to put that disclaimer, but it's an amazing tool. You should look at it. And again, it's not about the tool. It's a concept that I'm really talking about, right? There might be other tools which does things similar or better way. Find out. Uh, if you find out, please do share so others can also learn. But this is a very helpful way to look at flaky tests. Many a times teams don't know which tests are flaky because there's no, there's no historical trend of understanding which tests are flaky or not. This will give you that information so you can act on. It's a reporting server. A reporting server. No, you can set it up in your environment. Yeah, it's local. Yeah, they have a Docker or Kubernetes set up. Literally in five minutes, at least Docker, I have tried it. Less than five minutes, you can get the server up and running on your machine. Less than five minutes. It's very simple and straightforward. No, it's an open source tool. But they have a commercial side of it as well. Right? If you need certain type of support or whatever else, right? Or if uh, you want to use their cloud solution, that is a paid. But on local, you can do it. Definitely try it out. And any type of test data you feed in, right? It could be unit tests, API tests, UI tests, doesn't matter. You'll be able to capture the results over there and see the data. Any automated test runs, you can speed the data. It, yeah, it has historical data that based on which it is able to analyze. Yeah. Uh, now locator changes. Uh, this is where, uh, this is one, uh, I'll probably keep this as a last aspect. Uh, of this. There are some many other examples, but I'll uh, maybe pause after this point. So locator changes. Many a times the test failed because of that. But the functionality might be working correctly. The locator has changed. The test failed. That is because your test depended on that locator, not the user functionality. That's where self-healing comes into picture. There are a lot of tools that uh, and products that give you self-healing capability to uh, when locators change. But I am always worried about self-healing because the test might pass, but what if the location of that element has changed? Or it ended up clicking on some other element, right? And the test proceeded from that point, it failed somewhere else. But it's a false failure at that point, right? The root cause is missed out. That's where, that's why I do not like self-healing at all in that sense. But AppliTools recently came out with a product which has changed my mind about self-healing. And I'll tell you why. It's called the execution cloud. Now, what this does is, typically you run your tests on the machine and with whatever tool technology you have, the self-healing will happen over there. In this case, the test will run in the AppliTools execution cloud and that has self-healing capabilities. So if you are clicking on a locator which has changed, AppliTools will try to figure out if there's a, another matching locator and it will proceed. Where does my skepticism go? Because you are taking visual validations also at relevant point. So even though you might have clicked on a locator using a different locator for the same element, and if the position has changed, color has changed, layout has changed, or it clicked on something else, your visual validation will still catch that error, right? So you're combining functional and visual together, and that's where the risk is mitigated. It's not just clicking on something and proceeding. You're clicked on something, but was that the right thing? If not, your visual validation will fail for that. And that's a huge uh, peace of mind to me because I know my test is able to continue functionally, 
and visually also there is no problem in that functionality and the experience side of it. Without that, I would never use self-healing because there's a big risk. Am I doing the wrong thing? Is my application doing the wrong thing? So execution cloud is very, very helpful and valuable. And the aptitudes dashboard will show that, okay, this test passed because of self-healing. Or even if it didn't pass, self-healing was used over here. What was the original locator that you tried to click on or interact with? What was the locator that was used instead? It will show you all that information, including the video recording and everything, right? So you can go and play back and see what really happened over there. You have the information in your hand to take the decision. Okay. So execution cloud, huge value because it's very fast. And again, it works with the ultra fast grid. So it's, you get self healing, visual validation and scaling by making minimal changes to your existing tests. And you get a lot of value addition. Here. Okay. There are many other use cases where chat GPT comes into picture, writing code, refactoring, uh, debugging. Uh, in simple cases, we spoke about this, right? You give an image and it will give you an explanation about what that is. I also took a framework architecture diagram and asked it to explain. It was able to do that. Uh, explain exactly what the framework is about. I don't know how it did it, but it was able to explain the framework architecture reasonably well, the way I would explain it as well. That was very surprising uh, how it did that. One thing which I want to try, I didn't get a chance uh, is, can it transcribe the video as well? So the meetup, uh, this video that we are recording, for example, I want to give it that link to YouTube and say, create a transcript of this. It can, right? And that's where I want to see how uh, it butchers my accent <laughs> and what interesting words it comes up with over there. I'm sure there's some sensitivity filters over there, uh, but why not, right? I get 99% of the work done. I just have to proofread it and make it correct. I can ask it to take this and clean it up as well, right? To do an iterative way of that. But that can be very helpful. Inefficient automation, suboptimal uh, automation. Uh, though I've been working on Java for a long time, I'm still stuck in the Java 1.8 days of sorts. And that comes from my C or C++ programming language uh, about writing procedural code in certain ways. Though C++ was object oriented, it was still, you start thinking in procedural uh, way, right? So I still write very inefficient code, but this is very helpful. Chat GPT can help clean it up again as the example that you shared earlier, right? Uh, about give me a better implementation or implement this logic for me. That is great. But GitHub Copilot is very, very interesting for that. You were mentioning that earlier, right? So let me try and show some example of that. Is this valuable by the way? Are these different use cases? Yeah. Okay. So. My screen is visible. Okay. So here it's a simple test, a Selenium Java based test. It's there as a GitHub framework. If anyone is interested, I can share this uh, with you. But I have one test implemented add to cart. Now over here, I have a comment saying implement a new test to remove items from cart. I did add to cart. I want to remove products from cart, right? Over here with GitHub Copilot uh, enabled, I'm just saying public void and just pausing for a few seconds. I'm still figuring it out. Oh, there we go. Double option and it's giving me remove from cart implementation. The test is implemented exactly the way add to cart was including visual validation because I had visual validations over here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I take credit for <laughs> pressing the option button yeah. twice <laughs> and writing the comment. GitHub Copilot. It's a plugin in IntelliJ IDEA. It's available for all IDEs as well. And it's there as a free trial, but I have uh, taken the GitHub Copilot uh, subscription as well. Okay. And it works for various different programming languages as well. Now, will this test work? 99.9% .9 no. Because the locator to remove item from cart is probably going to be different. Maybe the way you remove items from cart is going to be completely different as well, right? Adding a product to cart is easy. You go to the product search page, add to cart. How do you remove it? You have to go to the cart to remove it in most cases, right? And that's what you would do. So this test most likely is going to fail, but I'm still amazed at how it has been able to implement this just based on a command prompt. Likewise, implement a new test to clear items from cart. 
Okay, so public two options. Okay, it didn't work this time. Oh, it just took time. It just took time. Okay, clear card. I see an error over here. It has not updated the comments and all that might be there, but it's okay in my opinion. I get a lot more out of this. Now I could say this is actually a test class. I don't know if I have a main class. I could say, okay, this is class name, uh, shopping cart. Okay. And I have some method over here. Public static add to cart. And over here, I'm going to say string product name int quantity. It's telling me the quantity. I was thinking of something else over here, but it's uh, given me that. Okay. Now, uh, public static void, of course. Now over here, I need to implement this method. I could, uh, first of all, uh, refactor, uh, not refactor, generate and create a test out of this shopping cart test add. But I want to add tests for this, right? Test driven development. See, test add to cart. I didn't do anything. I have a dummy method over there. It was able to create a test over here. When I run this test, of course, it's going to do nothing. But I would typically have throw exception or something, return null and do an assertion on that. And I'm able to make progress. So whether it's unit testing, whether it's API testing, whether it is functional testing, any type of coding, GitHub Copilot can help a lot as well. And this is something, again, I'm uh, learning more about this. You can go to GitHub Copilot and say, okay, uh, uh, refresh and show me what options I have for you. Except solution. Okay, it's just giving me more uh, things to implement automatically over here. Very powerful. Again, GitHub Copilot also would have the same kind of security concerns that you would have for chat GPT type of things. Because how it is learning, how it is applying that information, you need to be a little sensitive about that and understand the context well. So before you try all this out, do this on a pet project, maybe not on a work laptop, maybe not on VPN, whatever, right? However it works. But privacy concerns are real. They are not just a hype. A lot of, lot is again subjective relative, but a lot of people have lost their jobs because they unintentionally exposed internal information to the tool. Unintentional, but proprietary information got leaked out. Many organizations around the world have blocked the use of chat GPT and similar tools because of this concern as well. It will get better. They might end up using a private version of that, on-premise version of that, whatever way it works. I still have to figure that out and learn about it. But that concern is very real. Be very watchful and uh, careful about that. But by all means, on your uh, personal laptops and all, please do try it out. It can be transformational. You can learn a lot out of this and you can prevent reinventing the wheel. I think uh, it's amazing how this technology is evolving. You will be able to definitely get a lot of value from it. Uh, how many of us try online uh, problem solving for websites or for interviews, we practice uh, programming questions and all, right? So there is, I don't know if I have an example. Yeah, last thing, one minute. The code. You could just take any uh, programming example. Uh, lead code problem. So take any uh, programming question, try it out yourself, and then say, okay, uh, I want to, I'm not able to get the solution, right? I just copied the URL and I go to chat GPT and say, okay, I'm just going to give it this, not even give a prompt, just give the URL and let's see what it is going to do. It's describing the problem to you and it is going to give you the solution as well. Yeah, you, no, so this is, this is the last thing I wanted to share. Uh, I think this is in Python. Yeah, this is in Python, as I was saying, right? Thanks for coming.
yeah no 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 worries we are actually done uh, as well but uh, i hope this has been in uh, valuable right we'll can accept it yeah. okay so i'm going to stop recording over here